I want to touch on this uh, flight to quality topic. So we have seen strong performance in Bitcoin year to date. I think it's like 100%. Smart contract platforms are maybe 50% up. And then selective group of DeFi tokens have done relatively well. To your point, there is a strong performance in some of the more liquid aspects as well as kind of flight to quality concept, right? What does that mean in terms of the uh, overall space? Uh, how should you think about that? Because you, you can you can relate this to traditional markets too, that uh, liquid markets tend to lead in terms of some of the expectations or repricing, right? So I'm just wondering how you're thinking in terms of uh, on some of the products that you are managing, whether it's uh, private funds or valuations of some of the protocols, right? Uh, are we kind of done with the devaluing the, or the repricing on the private side? Or uh, are we thinking there is more, more to be done there? And then... Um, just in terms of uh, understanding that uh, sort of liquid versus not li liquid sort of component, uh, how should we think about valuations in general in the space? Yeah, maybe I can start on the private side and then other people have better perspectives on the, the public side. But on the private side, uh, I think we actually bottomed in Q2 uh, when it comes to valuations. So if you look at the secondary markets, um, th those valuations have come down a little bit more into Q3 we're talking, you know, the crypto unicorns, decacorns that raised at, you know, multiples that made absolutely no sense relative to public markets, you know, 80, 100 times uh, ARR type, type multiples. And those businesses are all, you know, trading secondary markets at 70, 80% discounts now. And they've, some of them have actually grown into that valuation. And, and so we've seen that right sizing. But when it comes to things like seed deals, series A deals, we probably had that repricing a little bit quicker because so many funds were sitting out earlier in the year. They didn't want to invest. They were concerned about you know allocating too quickly. They were concerned about where the market was going. And they were hearing from their LPs to, to sit and wait and see what happens. And so people were sitting out you know, into Q2. As we got you know that better sentiment into early Q3, uh, we started to see a lot more capital re-enter the space. We started, started to see deals get a little bit more competitive. And the pricing has probably gone up a little bit at that earliest of stages. I think the mid-stage, so-called Series BC, still basically dead because the reality being there's only a few crypto funds who do that stage right now. Uh, it's, you know, injuries in us, a few others. Um, but the traditional guys who were maybe, you know, kind of crossover funds or were, you know, a little bit of tourists, they're, none of them have come back yet. And, you know, they, as they tend to do, will probably come back uh, when they, it's de-risked and some of the rest of us have, you know, already allocated and when valuations are high again. Can I just... Just a follow-up question that if you kind of think about uh, last couple of years, they have used token as a mechanism to raise capital, essentially. Do you think that sort of tokenization aspect that is a protocol sort of launches a token and then you use that to raise the capital, do you think that's sort of game over or do you think there is still a, a use case to use the token to essentially... Uh, decentralize the protocol and raise the capital? Or do you think that's just a function of a regulatory environment that we're in? Yeah, it, it's definitely contextual, right? So there are protocols and businesses and applications where having a token is the right mechanism for how they are supposed to raise capital. And there are ones for which in the past couple of years have issued tokens and it makes absolutely no sense. There's no real reason for them to exist, right? And what we've seen is, at least in the US, people are trying to figure out you know, what is the right way to raise capital? What is the right way to, uh, they may even decide to raise capital into an equity business, but still have a token to decentralize over time, et cetera. And they're trying to bridge that gap between, you know, what is a hostile SEC and regulatory environment in the US today versus what is the right thing for the open source software that the people are building right now. Um, and so, you know, we've seen things like Uniswap Labs, where of course, you know, they issued a token and raised a token. Uh, uh, originally, and then they raised a large round into the equity recently, and now they are, you know, uh, there's value accrual at their front end, and it's real revenue. But so what? Do, what happens to the token? Is it orphaned, etc.? And I think a lot of these guys are trying to figure out, you know, how do we bridge that gap? And the pendulum swung this year all the way over to the equity side, and now we're seeing it starting to swing back, where people are figuring out, you know, what what's the right place to be in the middle, and it's something we're still figuring out as an industry. Yeah, I think you have to. It's hard to be creative right now, and and um, and you need you need revenue. It's it's that simple in order to appease investors in any way, and their requirements just went up. Um, audits 
obviously are, are forefront. However, in this industry, it's impossible to get an auditor if you don't already have one that's that's big. Um, I spend a lot of time helping even VC funds and other ones trying to find auditors because we service a lot of auditors and it's really, really challenging um, because none of them want to accept them because of their own risk committees, which is a bit ironic. They're, they're supposed to be the, the ones that are uh, meant to, to help businesses be mature, in my opinion. So I think if you're an auditor, you should be accepting clients in the crypto industry. Um, and, um, and there's a number of other circumstances like that that are making it very difficult for businesses to operate, which then is making it difficult for investors to invest. However, we're seeing a lot of um, things that we don't control, like the Bitcoin halving, um, uh, the S1 filings, kind of, I'll put those in the middle, but obviously everybody's looking forward to those. Um, and there's a lot of other, and if you go to, I mean, I could, I could list countless countries around the world, Hong Kong, Brazil, uh, Liechtenstein, Switzerland, Germany, UK. Um, there are so many traditional businesses right now that are requesting some type of a digital asset license to do something unique that's all planned to launch in the first half of next year. Um, I think all that momentum will, will finally work its way back to, to something that investors can invest in. Um, and, uh, and create a lot more momentum. So I think it's, it's the, right now it's the time to work investing or fundraising is, is really hard, but hopefully it's going to be corrected here by Q1, Q2. Yeah, Rob. Oh, I was going to circle back on the flight to quality, uh, discussion a little bit and just tweak it a little bit. So I'd say it's a flight to quality and also a thirst for information. Uh, what we have seen is a lot of investors are flocking to those quality venture funds, uh, quality name brands like, you know, Rob had mentioned, uh, people want to decrease their number of relationships to a couple of quality uh, managers, but they're also asking more questions. And they're not just playing into the FOMO of, okay, this is, you know, the first close is happening in a month, like, let's, let, let's just uh, write a check and get in. They're asking real questions on diligence. They're asking real questions on use case and, and why an, uh, a fund is um, investing in what it is. And we hear this question a lot of uh, what are the actual exit potentials? Like, you know, you've raised a few venture funds. Uh, you, you have a little bit of DPI, but most of your returns are paper, like what is the actual exit potential? So I'd say that while people are flocking to quality, um, quality funds, they're also taking it a step further and asking more questions, uh, which is very healthy to see, I think. And, uh, it's, you know, it's, it's a natural part of the cycle. People should be asking questions. People should be demanding more from the, from the partners that they have in the, um, in the space. So there were a few subtopics here I want to address three. The one is valuation. The other, Ivan, as you had mentioned, is altcoins, what's happening there. And then I want to address the, the comment about service providers, or specifically auditors. So we have a liquid investments in our portfolio, uh, essentially venture style investments. Uh, because we are a liquid fund, we have to value our portfolio much more frequently than your typical VC or even private equity funds. And so that's taught us a bit of a lesson over the past few months. And that first and foremost, we've had to go hire a third party valuation agent to help us value this stuff. And the other reality, which is, I think, common knowledge amongst most of us, but just to state out loud, is when it comes to crypto investments, not necessarily getting something that you could value such as cash flow. So you have to consider things such as comparables or, again, the value of tokens or underlying assets. And I will tell you, that's been a challenge for the valuation agents that we've engaged with. Uh, we interviewed a bunch of them. We, we obviously made a decision on one of them just because we felt that they probably had the best sense as to how to properly fair value an investment. But the reality is, is that everything's being discounted. And so to the point that Rob made too, that has to kind of get flushed out over the next few months and the next year to kind of stabilize to make private investments, liquid investments uh, actionable and interesting. Now, for the point uh, about altcoins, and I want to use a phrase that Robbie had just used, which is flight to quality. That's been an issue on the liquid side because a lot of altcoins, although some have done well, have not done great. And the main major issue there is when you create a line of demarcation between CFI and DeFi. Most altcoins trade DeFi. And again, from the perspective of an institutional investor or working with other institutional investors, 
they have very little tolerance for investing in either directly on their own or through a manager investing in DeFi because they're just afraid of all the regulatory things that could happen to them or the regulatory implications of investing in these things. Uh, they're afraid of common technological security issues such as hacking. And so, again, that's forced a lot of liquid crypto managers, hedge fund managers specifically, to, again, limit their strategy, which really hasn't shown the potential of what they're capable of because of this notion that there's just this immediate fear of investing in, in altcoins or specifically DeFi altcoins. And more specifically, back to the regulatory issue, as long as there remains uncertainty, at least here in the U.S., particularly with the SEC or even the CFTC, as long as there remains uncertainty, then people are going to be forced to trade with certain counterparties. And again, if you go with a regulated counterparty, they can only trade certain types of crypto assets, and that puts limitations on the strategy. Now, for the last point that was brought up with regard to auditors, this has been a very big point of focus for us. We've seen a lot of managers, both VC and, and liquid hedge funds, uh, have their auditors walk away from the engagement, which is obviously a very, very bad sign. Uh, it's not necessarily that there's something nefarious going on in the manager's operations. It's just the issue that, to the point that was raised earlier, there's not a lot of experience in the audit field with regard to auditing crypto. Um, there are, I would say, maybe one or two of the big four that seem to, uh, or at least give the appearance of being much more experienced there. But there's a whole another level of, let's say, tier two auditors uh, that have tried to get into the space, but very quickly realized that they were in over their heads and had to walk free from engagement. So that, too, is going to be an hindrance, at least for the foreseeable future, before we start getting some real capital in the air in order to, again, uh, give justification to the audits and give people a comfort level that they require.